We're so happy that you chose to attend this session about health and the IDD toolkit and many other things. Um, through this session, by the end of this session, we hope that you'll have a better understanding of the issues that face people, the health issues that face people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then you'll also know more about the IDD toolkit and the many uses it can have. And so now I would like to turn things over to Janet Shouse and we'll make a mic change too. And Tom Cheatham, and I think maybe if you have the, um, the handheld, we can introduce each of our self-advocates and walk through. We're gonna have information that we've gathered from them in focus groups and also ask them to comment some on the issues that we're talking about. So do we want to have the advocates introduce themselves yes. first? Uh -huh. Okay. Here you go. Hi, my name is Shayla Osborne and I go to Lipscomb University and I'm in the IDEAL program. How old are you? I am 21. Okay. Hi, my name is Nancy Everett and I am um, from Lyme Bridges. And I'm 50 years old. And where is Lifebridge? Um, in Cleveland, Tennessee. Thank you. Okay, my name is Natalie Miller. I'm from West Tennessee, Mammoth Lutherans, down in Bartlett, Tennessee, and I'm 22 years old. Okay, thank you. I'm Dodge Price. I live in Northport, Tennessee. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicholas Penner. Um, I am um, I'm a, an alumni of um, 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 the Next Steps program at Vanderbilt, and I am um, 21. Thank you. You want to switch our slides there? Okay. So, where did we get our information? We talked to self-advocates and looked at research on health disparities uh, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We talked to uh, a group at Next Steps at Vanderbilt and Ideal at Lipscomb. And um, these folks in the middle here uh, serve as advocates with the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities on healthcare issues and other issues as well. So we asked about interactions with healthcare providers. And then we asked what would they like doctors and nurses to know about them and about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And what we found were, in our focus group, um, all the individuals had primary care physicians, but most who were in that college age range still saw pediatricians. Uh, most of our group saw a doctor on a routine basis, and they all liked their doctors, and most were satisfied with the appointment process and the waiting times, which I wish I could say I was uh, satisfied with the waiting time at my doctor's office, but anyway. And um, one of the issues that many individuals have reported as an issue is that they don't feel like their doctors listen to them, that our focus group individuals felt like they, they were listened to and, and things were explained to them. And so what, uh, what else did we find? <laughs> Nobody liked immunizations or getting blood work and all the tests that they run. And um, one person said that a failure to be warned of a drug side effect left her with a severe sunburn because the doctor hadn't bothered to tell her that that was an issue she should be concerned about. Um, and one of the things, and I think most of us would feel this way, we wanna know in advance if there are gonna be blood tests or other kinds of work um, done. Nobody likes surprises. And, um, I'll let you read that, but we'll ask uh, we'll ask Shayla to talk a little bit about her experience with with her doctor, and you've had you've had quite a bit of experience with physicians and such, haven't you? Yes. And and you like your doctor. I do. And you have a team of doctors. Yes, I have a whole lot of doctors actually. And do you have insurance? Yes, I have uh, Ten Care and Cigna. Okay, and um, do you have to wait long to see your doctors? Uh, it depends on what doctor I go to. Okay, um, and you want to pass the mic on? 
How about you? Do you like your doctor? Yes, I do. And do you have a team of doctors or a primary care I physician? I have a primary and a neurologist. Okay. And do you have to wait long to see your doctor? Um, normally I don't, but like occasionally, um, most of the time I make the appointments and then there are times when my sister does, but I go most of the time to my appointments. I get dropped off at my appointments and um, I um, go and usually at my primary, um, I do have to wait, but not, uh, if I have to be worked in, I do have to wait in that, but uh, when I have to wait, it's about 30 to 45, <coughs> 45 minutes. Um, and is but, that okay? Um, sometimes it is, depending on how I feel <laughs> and that. Yeah. Because I have problems with sinuses and if I'm real sick, I'd rather be right in there mm. and that. Now, do and you have insurance? I do have insurance Okay. and that. And do you feel like your doctor uh, listens to your concerns and talks to you? Yes, he does listen to me. And I am a little bit of a uh, difficult a patient <laughs> because of the fact I've, I do get on antibiotics and that, and sometimes when I'm on the antibiotics and I go back and I go back to him, it's like he's got to figure out uh, the, another strength mm. because being an epileptic, He's got to make sure that another antibiotic doesn't conflict with my medication mm, okay. and that. So um, he has to make sure and if, if he needs to run a blood work, then he's got to make a schedule for that mm, okay. and that. And so, but most of the time I do get in there, but if there is a situation, then I do have to wait. Okay. You want to pass the mic to Ashley? Hello, once again. <laughs> do you like your doctor? I love Dr. Emily Hammond and my psychiatrist, and he always listens to me when I have a day, and, and I hear a little Meet her here. Okay. My relationship with Dr. Emily Hammond is a good relationship because he talked to me and he let me do whatever I have to say and what my concerns are. Like, for instance, he explained the, the different not to drop my medication and what. And let me explain the different night drug medications are and what they are for and what are the night about before the driving to me. Do you know what my symptoms not that I have and what mental diagnosis and the notorious mental illness known as bipolar dysmorphia, depression, and you need not come and and those are a part of my mental illness that I was diagnosed and was born with that I was a newborn baby and that I have to deal with all of my life that childhood and adolescent and now adulthood and that the reason that I need my that time drug that I knew all my life that childhood and adolescence 
And now I know that that the reason that I name my night Hydra is with the daughter of the ham and that's why it is more than that. I have to take my medication so that my mental illness would not take over me and that is why I need to keep naming my night Hydra every three months. So that I can get the help that I need. Can we let Donna tell us a little bit? Um, do you do you like your doctor? Uh, yeah, I do. Do you think he or she listens to you and and uh, yeah. talks to you and explains things? He listens what I say, and I like Doctor Everberry much. And do you have insurance? Yeah. Okay. Nicholas, you like your doctor? Absolutely. And, and do you think he listens or she listens to you, he or she? Um, absolutely. You know, um, I have about um, I have three do I have three doctors total. I see um, for me they've always been true mentors to me because it's like all all of them aren't like like. Um, all, like all therapists, but it's like I can even I can talk to them about anything, and it's a little I get a little nerve it's a little, little nerve wracking, but you know it's actually good to have people that you can talk to about things that can be it can be a challenge to talk to your own parents about. Really, is it a challenge to talk to your parents? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> parents are parents, so <laughs> that's okay. Um. So, uh, what, can we go back to the other slide? Um, what did what did our focus group want their their doctors to know that that they are smart and happy, that they appreciate the services that the oh sorry, I figure I have a loud enough voice, but maybe not always. Um, <coughs> that they appreciate the services that the physicians provide, um, that the individuals are very friendly, that they are a loving, caring human being. They wanted their physicians to have a nice day, if we could tell them that, and to thank them for their hard work. And so what have we found through research? What we told you just now is what our focus groups and other self-advocates have talked to us about. Um, but what do we say in the, re what do we find in the research? Um, that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities want to be treated with respect and valued as as an important part of the community. Um, as we talked about, they want to be listened to. Um, and they want to have choices in, in, their, in their care and who they see and um, to be able to make decisions about their medical care and to have services that are reliable and responsive to their needs. Um, we also know that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, have more medical uh, conditions than an average individual and they may have complex uh, conditions or multiple conditions. Um, many individuals, I don't think our team is here today has this, it has this difficulty, but many have trouble explaining their symptoms or telling what hurts or, or if they hurt or if they're sick. Um, and then there are difficulties in accessing health care. Um, due to attitudes of providers, and many providers don't understand the <coughs> medical complexities of working with this population. And um, so that's one of the things that we hope to, with the IDD tool, could improve, is their ability to understand and recognize the medical conditions involved. Um, another, another issue, which I don't think we have on our slide, is a lack of insurance. Uh, that prevents a lot of folks from receiving care. And um, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as we mentioned, often have communication issues. Uh, they may communicate nonverbally or using technology, um, which doctors aren't necessarily familiar with. Um, there's a tendency for diagnostic overshadowing that says, oh, you know, that's just a part of their developmental disability. He does that because he has autism, or he does that because he's got uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, there are issues of consent 
um, making sure that the individual patient understands what's being asked of them and, and consenting to a medical treatment. Um, for some people, there are actual physical barriers. They can't get up on the examining table because they're in a, in a wheelchair and the doctor doesn't have an adjustable table. Um, and then, oh, here we go. There are insurance issues, uh, not only in terms of having insurance, but one of the big things that I'm learning is that because it often takes more time to, to work with an individual with an intellectual disability, they don't fit into that nice 10 to 15 minute office visit that, that many physicians are used to coding and billing for. And um, we found through research there's little attention paid to wellness and health, uh, uh, preventive health care. And so that's another thing that we're hoping to, to change. That, um, and one of the things we encountered is that many times doctors don't talk about sexual health at all because their idea is people with intellectual and developmental disabilities don't have any thoughts about sex. So, so why do we need to worry about that? Okay. Um, and Dr. Cheatham is going to walk us through very briefly the IDD toolkit. But I wanted to say, does anybody have any questions for our panelists? And before? I think Dr. Cheatham does. Oh, so Dr. Cheatham has questions. Oh, he's got a mic, though. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. He's um, armed. We can certainly take questions from the audience if the panel is willing to answer questions first. And then I have some questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm curious if you've ever not liked your doctor and asked to switch and how that process went for you. Um, I, I have had to switch several times um, because of my family did not like my neurologist. Um, because of situations and that um, when my mom was here and that and then when my sister took over she didn't like uh, my neurologist and that and then um, then she didn't like my primary at one time and so I did have to switch. We, we, without getting too personal, and, and if you don't want to answer, that's perfectly okay. Can you tell us why? Does well, um, the neurologist, it was, he wasn't um, doing like, um, if I remember correctly, um, the medication and that um, the medication wasn't um, done correctly and that and um, and then the primary um, the um, there was a time when um, when I was in the hospital um, it took a little bit longer and that to get the doctor there and so it just um thank you the, the reason i ask is you all are to be congratulated because and it may be in your role as self-advocates that you're different from what the research tells us because there can be and, and certainly some people with disability <coughs> have a lot of problems getting uh, medical care from doctors and nurses and others and so um, it's wonderful that you all are, are doing so well but we're also trying to learn what would help other people so um, it, it may be just all your experience being self-advocates mm -hmm. that you are able to stand up and push your opinion and that's great. Well I want to be able to help others. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. That did, did anybody else have an experience where they encountered a, a medical provider they didn't like and had to switch or chose to switch? No? Yeah. No? 
Okay. I have a question. I have a question. Who lives at home and who is supported by another source or even by yourself? Who lives at home with their family? I live at home with my sister and brother in law. Okay. So everyone else then lives in like a supported living or something? I live at home. At home. Okay. I live in the poor Okay. I live with my brother and sister in law. Okay. So four out of five live at home. Or with family. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Other question? I know y'all stated that you, you don't have to wait typically a long time to take uh, to go to an appointment. But do you ever feel like you're rushed at appointments? Because we've experienced that with some of our folks that they're rushed in and kind of rushed out. Do you feel ever feel like you're not getting 100 percent of the attention? Um, probably for um my for for me though um you know um I think um. I've, there's been time and time I've um, gone to an appointment and I feel, I mean, I feel oh, a little rush going like in the vet, but I really think to be completely, completely honest, um, you know, um, I think it just depends on like if, what, what, what the appointment or reason for the appointment, like going for it, because it was like a um, you know, checkup or something, that usually takes longer for most people. But if it's just like a quick thing, like in blood, blood drawn or something, that's a good reason that's quicker and like something like that. But you know, for me, I mean, sometimes it's quick, but uh, my doctors are really you know, smart and um, certified what we're doing. So um, yeah, I trust them. Anyone else? Did anyone else ever feel rushed? There's been a time or two that I have felt that way. But of course, it depends on the, the appointment and and the situation. And that because there's been a time or two when I've gone to my neurologist or my primary, and I've been right in there and then right out. But it's been because of the situation and the. Um, it could be because of blood drawn at the primary, or um, out there hadn't been anybody in there, and that, or it could be, it could be something else. Anybody else? Let me tell bit. There are times that I don't know right at all, John. I have really bad anxiety problem. No, I let it be. I let the go to my appointment like go in and come out. I don't like to wait more a long period of time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You can just say okay. questions or comments. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, if this room was full of doctors and nurse practitioners, so ignore all the people here, if there was only doctors and nurse practitioners here, what, what would you want to tell them that they could do better? Because, you know, even if things are good, we all can do better at some things. So, we'll start at the end and work back. Well, again, like mentioned in the slide, um, I don't like surprises when it comes to getting blood work and what whatnot. I don't like that because it makes me even more nervous. I mean, I guess who doesn't, but I don't know, that's just my opinion. But that's the one thing that you would say you really yes, like for doctors to know. Let you know ahead just, of time. Just tell me near the beginning. <laughs> and do the rest of you want to? Um, one thing that you'd want this room if it were doctors and nurse practitioners to know? Well, I think it'd just be wise to let people know when they are going to have blood work or a test done ahead of time instead of calling them like either at the last minute or um, let them call them and say, 
you're going to have this test because a lot of times um, that's happened to me before. But um, it's best to let people know ahead of time when they're going to have something done. That's what I think. Okay. I think um, I think the time of the you'll realize that when you have like your animal medical <coughs> and they want to wait for the last minute and tell you about it, I like me I like to know ahead of time where I'm gonna have my animal medical done. And pretty much like that. Sometimes you may have to wait your turn to go in the doctor's office, you know, like that. Doris has a wonderful doctor. <laughs> she has a wonderful doctor. She has she will not complain about him at all. <laughs> What's the one thing you would tell a room full of doctors that they could do better? Oh, I have so many questions in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well then they just share okay. some of them. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll turn up the whole time. Um let's see. Okay, um I mean definitely um I do, uh, uh, you know, um, whenever I, I find, whenever I know, I find like, oh, I have an appointment, or um, that um, I have the next day, or like um, five, um, five days out, you know, like that. It's a little nerve wracking because a lot of people, a lot of, you know, people hate going to the doctor. It's not the funnest joyride in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's something we all have to do. And I think for me, you know, is, a human being. I do really feel like, you know, um, it's good to sit, you want to know how, like, how to do a better job taking care of yourself. Uh, you want to eat healthy, you want to make good choices, and go into a, a pediatrician or any kind of doctor that, that can get, that knows that kind of, knows about that kind of stuff. Getting better feedback is always a 100% thing you want to know. To keep you, to keep your body healthy, so you can live a longer, healthier, healthier life. Okay. That's that's a really good question, and maybe everybody else can answer that. Does your doctor or nurse practitioner talk to you much about what you need to do to stay healthy? Well, well, you know, I have cancer in the family. No, I like my friend and my mom had nervous cancer, but that doesn't mean that I have it because I've been tested more so many times and there nothing that there is no problem with me and that I always they help me no matter what. So your doctor's keeping a good eye on things because of the what reference in the family to watch you special for. Yeah. Anybody else? Does your try. doctor concentrate on things you need to do to keep yourself healthy? Um, my mom had diabetes and so um, I, my doctor has, at first the doctors when I was switched, um, that was one reason why my sister switched my primary. Um, that he wasn't really uh, explaining some things. But now, the doctor that I have now, um, he does keep an eye on uh, my weight and um, lets me know, and I do keep, um, I keep eating healthier, and, it, and um, I keep working on my weight and everything, and he keeps an eye on it very well, and gives me ideas and suggestions. I think one of the important things you mentioned that probably most of us in this room uh, could do too is it's up to us to watch what we eat. Yes. Your doctor's watching it, but mm -hmm. it's up to you. Yeah, it to is really up to work it is up that. to you. And you're yes. doing that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yes. You. Well, 
was the question again? <laughs> Did your doctor do things, or nurse practitioner, um, do things or talk to you about things that you can do to keep yourself healthy? Well, the only thing that I can think of is um, I have to get my cholesterol checked every once in a while. I've had high cholesterol since I guess I was in about first or second grade. And, um, but that's mostly what we watch. I mean, I have to get it checked every now and then. Um, but I will say, I had one doctor that asked me, you know, do you exercise regularly? Do you, uh, how healthy do you eat? But she's pretty much the only one that's asked me. I don't really have many doctors that do that. <laughs> But you were eating kale soup the day I talked to yeah, you. Yeah, I was. So, okay. My parents are on a diet. On a diet now. <laughs> and, and that's something we all probably can do better. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about consent. So who gives permission for things? Uh, do you give your own permission? Or do you have help with that from a family or someone else? Maybe everybody can answer that question. That's actually a great question. I mean, Tom asks great questions I mean, like that. He does. <laughs> anyway, um, for me, you know, I try to make, you know, as a um, young adult, you know, I try to make um, as many um, of my decisions as I possibly can. Because I think, you know, um, just because you have a disability doesn't mean you can't do anything in the world. Though. But I think pushing myself and challenging myself to know that I haven't been raised by two um, awesome math, uh, math and English professor have raised me to, um, you know, make, 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 the, make, the, make, the, make, the, make, the, make the world a better place. And um, and be a good um, citizen and all of it. And boy, I got my I've done a good job of it. <laughs> um, no, I think you know making good choices and being independent is very important. And you know it's hard for some people. I think it's hard, but you know know that you uh, have you have faith in yourself and you can know you can do anything set your mind to. Is the number one or one of the number one important thing, things about. Being, um, being a human being. And that was a really great answer yes. to, to the question. I think other. Okay. Uh, well, what then, Jen? Who, when, when somebody has to give permission or consent for something like a, a test or something, who does that? Do you do that or do you have help from someone? Most of the time I have help because. If I have if, if I have it my way, I would gain my own consent, but no, I have people that already do that for me because sometimes I'm not able to make the right um, choice or decision when it comes to certain tests because when they tell me that I have to get my animal, you know, a woman thing, I tend to break out, you know, not the reason why I know how many of my own in them, but then in the end, I have people that are in more me. Okay. Donna? And you're not alone. I'm, I'm a family doctor, and I don't think any woman ever wanted to come in for that exam. <laughs> <laughs> I make my own decision, you know. What to eat and what to wear, you know, like that. And when the doctor talks about doing tests or something, you tell him what you want to do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to? I make my own decisions, but there are times when I, when I, I have my own sister to help, help me with. When I need help, I ask her and that. But I do, um, pick, I, I pick out my own clothes and stuff like that, make my lunches and stuff like that. But um, I do have my sister and family to help if, if I need, need them, I go to them. Okay. 
For me, it's kind of a combination of both. I mean, most things I make my own decisions, but if it's like financial or anything like that, usually I go to my mom or my dad, but most of the time I make my own decisions. Thanks. And I think when they're hard, really difficult decisions to be made, it, it's helpful to have somebody to talk to and mm -hmm. just get that other uh, And I think most of us do that. And I was mm -hmm. just going to say that. That's not any different from anybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, this has been great. And <coughs> folks are in wonderful shape. I think what we need to do is take all your doctors and clone them. Yeah. <laughs> because <coughs> we know from research that not all doctors and nurse practitioners are as good as what you've told us this morning. Um, so, um, a group of people got together and we developed some tools to help doctors and nurses um, with some of these issues. And there's really only one thing that, that <coughs> you need to look at. If you go to that website, and there's a brochure here at the front, so uh, you don't. Shall I pass them out now? Thank you. So you don't even have to write that down. www.idetoolkit.org. And what we've done there is take some tools. Absolutely, take as many as you want. I'll talk about them very briefly. That can do two things. They were designed to help mainly primary care, and you all have talked about primary care this morning, for those who, who feel like they don't know enough about looking after people with disabilities. And to address some of the things that we've learned from the literature, from the research, uh, our problems. Um, but the other really cool part of that is it lets people with disabilities <coughs> look at what kind of prevention things and so on they should have. So it empowers people. It empowers family members and paid staff in terms of their health care. So it kind of comes at good health care from two directions. So just the basic structure of this, there are generally <laughs> so you've got the website, you can go on and, and look at all of that. And we'd love for you to go on and look and browse around. And a lot of people have, and um, I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. So there are like four components, four sections. One is general issues, and that's things like communicating effectively, because doctors and nurses don't always communicate well. Uh, we talked about consent, and doctors and nurses often talk about having uh, problems or feel that they have problems getting consent from people with disabilities. There's a one-page kind of checklist that goes through some questions that may be more uh, appropriate for people with disabilities, and I'll show that in a moment. Things about organizing your office. You know, if somebody's anxious, and aren't we all when we go to the doctor, but if you're really anxious, having to wait a long time just makes that worse. So if somebody's really, really anxious, having that first morning appointment or the first appointment after lunch decreases the chance of, of waiting. So things like that. And then there's a form that can document the visit for that day. Next are physical health issues. And remember, that's what you're going to see if you go to the website. There are only three here. One is something called cumulative patient profile, and that's really a summary of uh, health-related information, quite a detailed summary, several pages. <coughs> and then because one of the big areas, and, and we talked about that, that people may or may not have a, a lot of attention for is prevention. What can you do, like if there's cancer in the family, or diabetes, or cholesterol, <coughs> all those things that can be checked so that you're keeping an eye on that. So what can be done to keep the person in good health? That's a very neglected area. And can I mention one thing? These preventive care checklists also have areas that are highlighted 
that are concerns, particularly for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, that wouldn't be on a standard check kit, checklist uh, for a, a typical individual walking into the doc doctor's office. That, that's a great point because these are all meant to be in addition to what the doctor and nurse practitioner would do for any person. And then these are some extra things to make sure people with disabilities uh, are healthy and having their uh, needs met. So one's for uh, males and one's for females. Then there's something called health watch table. And those are checklists for a variety of syndromes and conditions and they're listed there. The autism is one that we created here in Tennessee. The others were adapted from work done elsewhere. And so if, if a person has Down syndrome, for example, there's a checklist that goes through each body system with things that are more common. And it gives some recommendations about checking on those things. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's the dreaded blood test sometimes. It's like uh, checking thyroid uh, uh, in, in someone with Down syndrome, for example, because they're more prone to low thyroid. Um, so you see the, the table. So they go through basically head to toe various uh, things that the, the person can know, but the, the healthcare provider can watch for. And then lastly is the section on behavioral and mental health issues. And you see that that's a really big section. And it doesn't show up much better when I expand it. But um, it's things like a behavior crisis, a risk assessment tool, two tools that help that provider know where to start when somebody's coming in with challenging behavior. We know that at least primary care people often feel overwhelmed and where do I even start with this person? Um, and this gives them kind of a roadmap, a place to start. I'm not sure you that in a moment. Um, there's a one page interesting summary of psychiatric symptoms. And the important part of that, or one important part of that is there's really two, a, a, a list of symptoms, I'll show you that, and a column for baseline, and then a column to assess that person. The real problem is, if I don't know as a family doctor what this person is normally like, I may have a very wrong view, and so I'm comparing to what I think they're like instead of knowing what they're like when they're okay. So now I can judge when something's changed. Um, and some tools to talk about medications, because we know that people um, receive a lot of medications. As I said, that's not a whole lot more readable. And, and I don't expect you to kind of know all of this. I want to just give you a sense of what you're going to see, what it's going to look like, and encourage you to go on the website and walk around with that. So, and talking about not seeing, so this is the one page on informed consent. But let me just read uh, the, the six questions. And it, it's really designed not to force people to make choices if there's not a good choice. So at the bottom, the decision is, is the person capable, not capable, or unsure? Because sometimes you just don't know. So don't force me to pick yes they are or no they aren't. I don't know, which means I need more information perhaps. So does the, does the person understand that we're offering something for a health problem? And all of these are yes, no, don't know. Some examples there. Um, does the person know the nature of what's being offered, the treatment or the investigation, the test? Um, what are the other choices? Because maybe that's not the only thing you could do for that. So what choices do you have? You need to know that before you can, can decide if that's what you want or not. Um, uh, what about, what's going to happen if you say, I don't want this? You know, I don't want this examination. 
a person needs to explain what that might mean. Um, and then, are we sure that the person is not being coerced in any way in their decision making? And does the person have any condition, like a mental health condition, that might um, affect their ability to give consent? One common example um, is epilepsy. And I think we know epilepsy is more common in people with disabilities. And the thing is, that is an example of how if I have epilepsy, my ability to give consent could be different from one part of the day to the next. If I had seizures that nobody saw last night, I'm going to be more groggy this morning than I will be this afternoon. So I might not be capable of giving consent this morning, but by this afternoon, when I'm feeling better, I might be. So we sometimes forget, we think consent is some sort of fixed uh, ability, and it's not, it fluctuates all the time. Uh, this just gives you kind of an example. This is the health watch table on Fragile X. And so it's, it's, it starts with head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. They're mainly designed for adults, but there's some information on children as well. But they're really, these are adult tools for adults with disabilities. Um, and so it goes through some of those things. Uh, uh, Next is dental, then heart. Um, so, for its, pick. okay. So it's something called mitral valve prolapse, which can give strange pains and may require treatment or not. That's common in adults with with um, this syndrome. Maybe eighty percent of people have that. So it actually gives you some guidance as to how common some of these things are. Uh, sleep apnea, where people actually, well, their sleep is, is abnormal and um, it's often related to the structure of their throat and so they can partially block their airway and it can have some significant consequences. Here, um, it talks about obstructive sleep apnea and kind of some of the things that the provider, or you, the person who has this, or you, the family member, or DSP, can be watching for. So you get the idea. There's more to it, but I didn't want to take the time to show all of these tools. <coughs> That's something that you can take some time to do. What I really want to highlight is one of a pair of tools. And this is the caregiver part. So the person themselves would fill this out before you go to your primary care. Or the family can help with that. Or DSP can help with that. And this outlines some of the issues when the, the person's got um, some kind of behavioral or emotional concern. <coughs> so. Um, Things that are helpful to know is the person's level of functioning. Um, what type, what the cause of the person's disability is. That can be helpful to the doctor or nurse practitioner to know what other things to watch for. And then next section is basically tell me, because I'm going to use this when you filled it out and come to me as your primary care doc. Um, tell me all about the behavioral problem. The more detail, the better. Um, I'm worried because, especially if I don't know you, what are the risks? You know, sometimes people get very upset and might hurt themselves or other people. So there's a place to ask about risk and aggression. Um, how often the behavior happens. Um, then. Have there been any changes in uh, a variety of things that might help me think about what could be going on? Things like a uh, person's mood, or their bowels, or their appetite. So a kind of checklist of health-related things that could be helpful to me. 
one of the huge issues, and I don't think with any of you from this morning, but certainly some people with disabilities will not talk about pain or won't report pain. And sadly, some people with disabilities won't show pain the way many of us do. And tragically, that gets misinterpreted as the person doesn't feel pain and therefore it's not treated. That's absolutely wrong, period. It's wrong. People may show pain differently, but if we don't teach doctors and nurse practitioners and others that that might happen, they misinterpret that absence of typical pain behavior. So one of the questions deals with, could there be something that's causing the person pain? Um, environmental change, you know, has, have there been changes in the family or with somebody you live with? Um, what about supports? Vision and hearing, like with all of us, can be very gradual in their onset when there's a problem and it can get really bad before we recognize that. And if now I don't use language, I may not be able to <coughs> tell anybody that I've got a problem. That, of course I'm upset because I can't hear what you're telling me or I can't see what you're asking me to do. So it goes through these kinds of things um, in a fairly thorough way. Um, <coughs> what about other emotional <coughs> causes for my behavior that's changed? And then no forum ever has enough room to write everything down, so there's space for the <coughs> caregiver or the person to include other things. So it, it's, it includes common things that um, occur with people with disabilities and is a summary that then you can come into the primary care with. There's a, another tool that, that's kind of identical, but as you might imagine, the, the, the medical part is much longer because that's my job after all, so I've got this long checklist of things. And then I can look at what you've completed before you bring it to me and uh, summarize it on my part of the form. And that leads me to a whole comprehensive plan as to what we should do. Um, I mentioned the one tool, and I think this encourages us that these are, some people find these useful. So this is the one pager that I mentioned that has psychiatric <coughs> symptoms, and they're listed here. And there's a column for the baseline because you've got to know what was this person like before. What were they like when they were at their best? That's your baseline. And if something's changed and you're filling this out, and for it to be helpful is what's new, and then a place for comments. The reason we think that this is <coughs> at least useful is our <coughs> website that I gave you that's been operational since January of last year and this isn't even updated, so it's probably more. This single tool has been downloaded 80,000 times from 110 countries. And the tools that have been downloaded the most are the behavioral tools. So I think that's where the challenge is, trying to help people with disabilities who are experiencing <coughs> behavior issues to try to work through in a systematic way to figure out what's going on, and then how best to support that person. And there's Janet's phone number and email address. And mine, and the department. But there's Janet's. <laughs> <laughs> Because we've seen the interest and know how important this area is, we're, we're trying to grow this project. And we're delighted to let you know that Vanderbilt University, in conjunction with the Department of Intellectual De and Development of Disabilities and in conjunction with TenCare, is going to be developing um, online training for health professionals and for families. 
and this will be online on our website, so it will be free. And um, the nice thing is you share that information with, with your health professionals, they can receive that CME credit that they've got to get anyway. So there's a good reason for them to use that. In designing that training, we'd love to hear from you. You've, you've had a quick walk through the tools, but we'd like to ask you to take a survey and you're passing papers around to tell <coughs> us what's important in that training. What do we maybe think that we made clear and, and understand that you think could be made clearer? And so we're going to take into account your responses that we get and use that as we develop the training. And again, um, if you have questions about it, Janet's happy to answer questions <laughs> about that. So uh, I know we're, we have very little time. I'd like to ask you to help me think. Um, especially the panelists and Dr. Cheatham and Janet Ford. Especially the panelists being so open and sharing about your health experiences. And I think one of you said, I want to help other people. Yeah. And that's really evident in the way you share. I yes. have a question. As a provider agency, the biggest trouble that we have with supporting our ladies and gentlemen um, are the individuals that aren't able to communicate with the doctors. Um, the biggest area we're struggling with is a lot of those ladies and gentlemen that can't talk with the doctors and tell them exactly what they're feeling also don't have conservators. And so then when they need a med medical test, they look to us to sign consent forms and that's not our role, but they won't let the individual do it even though that they're a competent adult because they don't feel like they don't understand what they're telling them. Um, and we're kind of stuck. Um, the individuals that have families say that they can't afford to go through the conservatorship process. And then the other ones that don't have families involved don't have the money to go through the conservatorship process. So we're stuck and we're constantly worried that they're not getting what they need. You point out a, a really difficult issue, and part of it is the cost of conservatorship. Part of it is the lack of recognition that unless people have rights, unless those rights are taken away, mm -hmm. they still have their human rights. Mm -hmm. That said, for me to say, and, and I watched you through briefly the consent tool, I need to be sure that the person can understand. Now, what I don't know, and when, I, when we talked about the training we're doing, part of that communication will be focusing on those folks who don't use language, who don't communicate verbally, so that physicians and nurse practitioners can look at other ways, you know, um, the sort of thing like a visual schedule, like easy read information. So we need to teach people, providers, how to get consent and, and be satisfied that they've got a legal consent in someone who can't use words to answer. Not an easy process, but it's something that's critical. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing that I know happens and it's not legal is people look to you the, the and often the frontline staff, but it's no legal standing to get consent at all. It, it's a very difficult situation. We're aware of it, and the fix won't be quick, but it's certainly something that will work. Okay. And we're happy, um, and I know, I think we're out of time. Is I, we've gotten a nod. Sorry. We're happy if we give us your contact information to brainstorm between this project and then some other projects with the Arctic of Tennessee on conservatorship. We're happy to brainstorm some more. Thank you very much. Again, thanks to the self-advocates yes. and thank you all for attending.